Hi, Jay. How are you? Hey, Buffy. Doing well. Welcome, welcome, awesome. everyone. Great, great, great. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Indeed. Hey, Jay, why don't you take it away? All right. Fantastic. And we'll get started. As Buffy said, welcome, everybody, to our September 1st general meeting. Uh, another virtual Wednesday night meeting, and um, just glad to be able to be here and bring you some great content once again. So uh, glad, glad that everybody's here and in attendance, and hope you uh, get a chance to really get some very interesting tidbits as we talk today about preparedness for our real estate assets, specifically with uh, things like natural disasters. Seems very appropriate with some of the events that have happened in the uh, last couple of days, of course. Uh, Buffy, you want to go ahead and let's advance the slide and move on? Awesome. Thank you. So again, I, as most people probably know, but we, we again do this every general meeting just to make sure because we constantly have new people in attendance. So we want to make sure everybody understands that CFRI is a not-for-profit RIA. And one of the things about that is CFRI is not only one of, not too many that are not profit, not for profit RIAs, but one of the biggest and uh, the largest and oldest RIA in Florida. Uh, so one of the things that is very important to us, as you might imagine, is not only do we want to provide information that is helpful to everybody in the real estate community, we want to make sure that we're doing this and helping promote ethical real estate investing. That's, that's real big. Uh, one of the reasons why we have an ethics board and try to make sure everybody does follow the code of ethics for CFRI, while at the same time making sure that we provide a lot of good content and information for everybody. So giving you those educational opportunities and also networking opportunities. If you find yourself thinking, well, now, wait a minute, how are we going to do networking opportunities if it's virtual? Hey, believe it or not, we have that covered too. As you'll hear us talk about a couple of times tonight during the meeting, one of the things that we do on our general meetings when they are virtual is we provide a meeting after the meeting for our members. So uh, we, we cover that all the way around full circle. Thank you, Buffy. Uh, and of course, we wanna make sure that as we start every meeting, whether it's the general meeting or the focus, meeting, focus group meetings or counting meetings, and make sure we put in our disclaimer. We'll go through it real quickly. We do not exist to give legal, tax, economic, or investment advice. That's not why we're having this meeting. So we're gonna disclaim all of our liability for action or inaction taken as a result of communication to or from the members. And of course that means from us as officers and directors and so on as a part of CFRI board. The main thing we wanna emphasize is everybody needs to go out there and find their own experts and get their information from a true expert in that particular field, whether it's legal matters, tax matters, whatever it happens to be, but consult with those people. If you're not sure who they are, don't hesitate to check out the CFRI website and look at the business member, business member directory to find people that are part of CFRI and they are specialists in those areas because that's, that's what that's there for. Now, if you were not aware, uh, you've probably been hiding under a bushel somewhere, <laughs> um, but uh, CFRI is definitely available online in several different forms. I think one of the biggest is probably the CFRI members only Facebook page, where a lot of good information is shared, especially when it comes to things that have to do with uh, pending legal issues and things like the, the eviction moratorium and what, you know, what's going on with that. Uh, so if you are not familiar with, or if you're not part of places that CFRI is available online, you definitely want to avail yourself of that. And uh, again, the, obviously the CFRI members only Facebook page is for members only. So if you're not a CFRI member, we're going to talk about how you can become one very shortly. All right. Uh, one of the things that we are proud to say is that we are not only one of the, the, the oldest and largest RIA in Central Florida, but we are a part of a bigger organization called National RIA. And as being a part of National RIA, one of the things that does being in partnership with all the other RIAs is we get to partake of all of these different discounts and incentives that National RIA coordinates for everybody that is a member organization. Now, if you're asking yourself, okay, well, so what are some of those discounts? Well, we've got a slide to show you some of them. Buffy, if you could advance that one. Awesome, thank you very much. 
So here are some of the CFRI member, CFRI member benefits. Uh, and again, if you're not aware of these, if you're not sure about them, you can go to CFRI.net, check out the member benefits. If there's something more specific that you need an answer about, please do not hesitate to ask and we'll uh, find out that information if we don't already know it. But most of these programs have some really, really good incentives that, that uh, you can take advantage of, especially if you're gonna be using these services. So whether it's something like going and getting materials printed, maybe like at Office Depot, Office Max, whether it's uh, you know going and buying materials for a property that you're working on at Home Depot, there are a lot of good programs here. And if you're not taking advantage of them, you're really missing out. Um, Home Depot, especially, Again, most of us that are in the club, I, I mean, we already you know, we already take advantage of these, whether it's the, you know, the purchase rebates on 2% there, whether it's uh, the cabinet program that they have, the paint discounts, uh, just, you know, any in all of those. And it's not hard to do. It really, really isn't. There are a couple of caveats that um, I, I want to emphasize. One of those that is very important is you do need to be using the same email address that you use for, for your CFRI membership as the one that you're using for your Home Depot account. Because from time to time, they are going to correlate those and make sure that you know people that are signed up really are part of the RIA. So that's one that you want to keep in mind. And the other one is that program code that you see on the screen, the NRIA. That needs to be there for every card that you register that you might use at Home Depot, whether that's a credit card or even a gift card, you can register those under your account. And as long as they're registered there with the NREA, that's what's going to help track that and make sure you get your 2% purchase rebates and help you participate in some of those other programs as well. And when it comes to some of the other ones like uh, the Office Depot, Office Max program, uh, again, very easy to do. Yes, in fact, it tells you right there, you can just text CFRI card to the 844 number. You get essentially the, uh, the discount card that you can use. It's right there in the text message with your phone. You go in, you're going to do your purchase, say, hey, can you apply this discount? And uh, we've had some members get some pretty amazing discounts going and getting their printing and things like that done. So definitely, again, take advantage of it. If you're already going there and you're already having stuff printed, Make sure you're taking advantage of the discounts. So in addition to all of those discounts and things that you can find on the CFRI website, as I said before, there are other resources at the CFRI website as well, including finding out who all of those business members are. So all you have to do is go to CFRI.net, use your login, and there are a lot of resources there that you can take advantage of. Find that business member directory, find the information about the discounts, but again, let me reemphasize, if there's something that you're having trouble finding or you know you can't figure out exactly where it is or you have another question that isn't answered, please do let us know. First of all, we want to get you the answer. Second of all, if it's something that we need to add to or you know modify the website, we want to know about it so that we can make that available for everyone else as well. Now, one of the reasons that all of this exists is because at CFRI, we have a team of volunteers along with our um, paid person, that is our executive secretary, Ms. Buffy Becker, who does a fabulous job. Thank you, Buffy. Uh, in addition to what Buffy does, we have a team of volunteers that make all of this work. And uh, th those of us that are serving on the CFRI board currently, some of us are planning to potentially run again next year, but we are always, always, always looking for additional help. And you never know when we might need several people to serve as a part of our board. So if that interests you, if you'd like to be part of that team, if you'd like to help us out, if you'd like to ha help have a say so in some of the programs and education and what all we can do to make CFRI even better than it already is, we wanna know about it and we need you. So take a look at that slide. We are looking for candidates to submit their forms and there is a deadline. So pay attention to that deadline because any forms that come in after October 6th, they can't be considered for participation in the voting and participation for obviously the board for next year. It's a very simple, easy form. It's not you know 42 pages long or anything like that. It's very, very easy to do, but you can get that from, uh, let's see, Buffy, is that is it on the website or how do they get the form? I'm, it may say right on there and I'm not even reading it. 
It'll be on the website by 10 o'clock tonight. How about that? Perfect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't even have that earlier. The next mind. slide's on the website. Ready? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. There we go. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. So November 1st, I, and we have a newsletter, Jay. How about that? That's pretty impressive, I think. Yes. Newsletter, September newsletter on September 1st. Hey, what do you know, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, again, let me reemphasize just how fantastic a job Buffy does at helping us out with all this stuff and, and getting things like this done. As you heard her say, that form will be out on the website tonight for you as far as if you want to participate and register for uh, participation in the CFI board. And that CFI newsletter already created, ready, available, put together, and another wonderful job done by Buffy getting that all together and ready for us. That, that's just awesome. Thank you. All right, when it comes to the educational opportunities and especially the meetings themselves, uh, obviously, as everybody participating here today knows, we're meeting virtually right now. And a lot of that has to do with the changes that are going on in the environment and especially with our meeting locations. Uh, so that's one of those things that's kind of uh, up in the air. We have to look at it very closely, monitor it very closely and see, can we use the location? Are there any caveats that would make it virtually impossible to have an event, that type of thing. So what about the other ones? What about the other meetings in September? Well, as you can tell from the slide, most of those are going to be available in person. There again are a couple of locations, especially uh, Osceola County, where you know we just we don't have the option for using the facility yet. And uh, so Osceola County and uh, the commercial multifamily, as well as Seminole County this month will be held via Zoom. Uh, unless there's any last minute crazy things that go on, that's what you can plan on. But the way to keep up on that is go to the CFRI website, check out the calendar and see what's going on. That's where you can go. And what's even probably more important than that is not only go look and see what's going on, but please make sure you are registering for these events. Registration is really, really critical for a lot of these events because we need to know how many people are going to be showing up, especially when we are in places where we do have a hard limit on how many people can be in that location. Now, you heard me say earlier that for our members, we consider the networking a very important part of what we do. And one of the ways that we're doing that when we meet virtually like this is we have a meeting after the meeting virtually. So we are going to be doing that after our general meeting today. If you are a member of CFRI, it is a separate link. So like you see in red at the bottom there, this requires a separate Zoom login link. It's not like we're going to just continue this one. This is a webinar format. We're going to actually have a meeting where everybody can see everybody. Everybody has a chance to talk and even have a chance to go into breakout rooms and talk to people in a more uh, um, cozy setting where you just have a few of you and then Buffy will change it around so everybody has a chance to talk to some more people. Great opportunity. People love that. And if you haven't partaken of that yet and you're a CFRI member, you need to. Just make sure you go to CFRI.net and sign up for that event because again, it's a separate Zoom link that you will use right after this meeting ends. All right, moving on. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, that sounds fun. I'd like to meet some of those other CFRI members, but I'm not a CFRI member. Have we got a deal for you? <laughs> just call 1-800. No, just kidding. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Anyway, so limited time offer, and that is that you can get a three-month trial membership for $75 for a single individual. You can just go to CFRI.net and join. Again, it is a three-month trial membership. Now, obviously, you can sign up to be have a full membership. That's available, too. We'll talk more about that in a second. But for people that just, you know, maybe we're not sure, maybe I don't want to sign up for a full membership just yet, $75. You can try it out, see what you think. I think, and I believe most other folks that are members of the club would tell you, you probably will want to convert that into a regular membership very, very quickly. And Buffy, if somebody were to do that, you know, if they, let's say they sign up and they do the, the three month trial membership and then they say, hey, I want to be a member. Can they do that? What, what, what's their, what are their options? So if they decide to do it during that trial period, then mm -hmm. we're going to, um, we're going to give them the unused portion back towards their, their new membership. Plus we're gonna give them a $25 discount. So wait, there's more, Jay. <laughs> oh, there's more, tell me more. 
Absolutely, there is. You're right. <laughs> so if you are ready to join CFRI and you want that full membership, like Buffy just said, we're actually giving a $25 discount. So there's a promo code you can use, Fall 21, and you can just go out there to the website. You can sign up right now, save $25. You know, again, you've got two options there, but if you're not currently a member, you're missing out because obviously we have a ton of meetings available. And most of those, as you saw, are going to be in person this month, whether it is the county meetings, whether it's Orange County, Seminole County, well, Seminole County is virtual, but, you know, all of those meetings that are taking place, including, of course, all the focus group meetings. I mean, if you look at the calendar, you're going to see there are two or three meetings going on every week. So it's a busy schedule. There's a lot to partake of. And uh, again, if you're not a member, you're missing out. So we'd look hey, forward Jay, to having you. If, yes. if they join right now, then they can sign up for the meeting after the general meeting too. Because it's better. immediate. It, 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 their accounts open immediately. That's even better. So think about it. You want to do find out more and talk to some of the members and be a part of the meeting after the meeting, sign up now. All right. I guess that's my sales pitch for the day. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate everybody being here. And I know one of the things that I absolutely love about our general meeting, it's one of my favorite, favorite parts of the, uh, the general meeting. And not, not to slight any other part, but because for me, it's always so fascinating to see how Stephen does the deal and the dot of the month, and especially what he has found, because he finds all kinds of stuff in terms of new and unique deals. And I'm sure that this month is going to be another stellar example. So with that said, Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you. And oh, one more thing. If you have a dealer done of the month, please make sure and let Stephen know because we want to have you on our show. <laughs> All right, Stephen. All yours. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. So <laughs> yeah, guys, like Jay said, this is uh, definitely one of the highlights of each and every month our general meeting that we have and so we i brought you some good stuff and uh let me with that let me introduce lisa lisa booth are you there i'm here hi hey how's it going very well thank you good so we uh we named this we named this deal and we called this one the stalled house and we're going to get into more specifics as to why it's called the stalled house but before we do that, let's start with, you know, the time frame. So when did you get this deal? Uh, let's see. We got it at the end of 2019. Okay. So what was your method for getting the deal? Um, the signs or did you drive around? Wholesalers. Wholesalers? Yep. Okay. Very good. So at that point, um, how many types of these projects, right? So when you start got this deal, you came across your desk from a wholesaler, how many projects up to this point had you taken on? This was actually my, the second one purchased, but it ended okay. up being the third one that I did since it got stalled. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> interesting. Um, so with this one, what was the condition? So obviously it didn't look like this guys, for all of you. This is the finished product, but when you rolled up on the house, what was your first thought when you saw it? Well, it looked great from the outside because the outside was actually done. Um, yeah. The home had been started in 2006, it was brand new construction. And okay. so from the outside, the roof was done, the outside was completely finished, stuccoed, everything was looked good. And it was just on a little piece of a, a little corner piece of property. Um, but it had never been finished inside. It was in the framing stage on the inside. Okay, got it. So that kind of, like I said, frames a picture. So what was your initial intentions, you know, going into the deal? Was it always to flip or were you thinking about buying and holding it? What was your, your exit strategy? No, it was always a flip. Um, it was, uh, we were able to buy it at a really good price and we thought that we would be able to make some decent money off of it. And uh, so, yeah, it was always intended to be a flip. Okay, excellent. Okay, Buffy, next slide. So great purchase price after repair value, estimated repairs, this all looks good. And it's funny, this house is actually pretty close to where I live and it would just confuse the heck out of me. I mean, that picture to the left, what's the situation here? How did this happen? I see a garage and a tree. Yeah, garage and a tree, yeah. And you can see how close it is to the road. 
Um, it was super close on the side and also the front. As I said, it was on the corner. Um, the lot itself, when it was originally surveyed, was only 4,200 square feet just for the lot. And um, at, in, they, um, at that time, this is Seminole County in Sanford. Okay. At that time, they, the county would approve the property, but not really approve the driveway. So there was a garage attached, but when it came time to do it, you couldn't drive out of the driveway into the street. It was too close to the corner and too close to the street. So they wow. would prove us to have a driveway. So that was probably, I don't really know all the history. I was the fourth owner of the property. So I don't know really the history of why other people stopped or wanted to sell it or whatever, but it, that was just the first problem for me that came up. Um, oh, wow. Fourth owner, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, as I said, it was a tiny piece of property. The other problem that one of the owners encountered was that there was no room for a septic tank. As I said, it was 4,200 square feet. The lot was 40 by 128. And mm. there was no room for a septic system in a drain field. So the second or third owner in had to buy an additional strip of land on the back side of the property. So it turned it into an L shape in order to put the drain field. Oh, wow. Okay. So was another issue. So when I got it, as I said, it looked just like that, it looked pretty good. And there was a yeah. brand new septic tank and a brand new drain field. But because the lot was so um, short, 128 feet, it um, the, the uh, uh, septic tank was right outside the back door within about five feet of the back door. And the drain field was about 15 feet away. So there was this huge hump in the backyard. So there was no backyard. Oh it my was gosh. Really sad. Yeah, it was really sad. That's crazy. So I have so many more questions that I want to ask. And guys, if you have questions, <laughs> you know, throughout this presentation, we will have an opportunity at the end for that. But in the meantime, go ahead and throw them in the chat. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, not the chat, throw them in the Q&A section uh, <laughs> of the uh, presentation here. And then we'll address those as we continue to move forward. So with the city, because we've seen on some duds, the city can cause a lot of turmoil and trouble for folks with the city and all their requirements and then the uh, septic tank. How did you overcome those obstacles and stay motivated? Well, we were really fortunate. This was the in the county, not the city, which helped. Oh, okay. And the county, having had it sit there all that time and collecting $25 a year in taxes, they were really anxious to get it finished. So we had several meetings with different um, uh, people in the building department, including the building official, and he was great. And they really allowed us to, uh, we took, we were able to use the exterior uh, inspections that had already been completed. So we didn't have to bring the trusses to code. We didn't have to do anything what was already, that was already done. Oh, great. Uh, the septic tank was a little bit different because it was one of the reasons that it had gotten stalled was that the hump in the back did not have the proper slope. And so it had failed. So we were gonna have to do something with that. And so ultimately I had to add a little bit to my budget and we moved the drain field. And again, I told you they purchased that large strip of land on the backside, which was an extra um, 80 or 90 feet, I think, maybe a little bit more. Okay. So we cleared out the rest of that strip of land and we moved the drain field all the way to the back of that property. So, and along with doing that, um, we were able to dig it deeper and so there is an almost unnoticeable raise and a hump in the backyard. And so there's an actual yard now. All right, excellent. So yeah, that, that really propels us to the next slide where we really get to get into the meat of the repairs that were done. So you had estimated 95K and you ended up at 105. Is that primarily a result of having to fix work that wasn't done correctly the first time? That was the 10,000, which is what it took me to okay. do to move the drain field, clean out the property, move. We had to remove a couple of trees. There was quite a bit of, uh, of um, which is probably one of the reasons why they didn't do that originally. There were trees, there were stumps, there was a lot of overgrowth. And so that, that $10,000 is what it took me to, to do that. One other thing that was part of that was, um, and I'm not sure if I added a picture, but there on the side of the house were the electrical wires that and the electrical pole is right outside the back door. And the guy wires were right in the um, uh, way of where we ended up putting a driveway in the back. And so we had to move the guy wires. So we had to go through Florida Power um, and get the guy wires moved, which was really not that difficult and not that expensive. Um, I think we ended up spending like $800. So it really wasn't bad at all. 
And that gave us enough room to be able to do that. And that opened up again, the backyard and enough room for a driveway. And that was part of that $10,000. Excellent. Real quick, I primarily do vacant lots. So what are the guy wires? What are those? Guy wires are those wires that come off the power pole that hold it to the ground so that it ah. doesn't over on you when you go by. Oh, okay. All right. See, learning something today. Awesome. Very yeah. good. So we do have more pictures and we'll be able to get into some of the specifics of really the condition of the home. So we know the outside is kind of a mess. Uh, here, it, this kind of dictates or shows what you were trying to illustrate to us before, right? With the guy, uh, those wires, and then also the tree. So could you talk a little bit more? And that's yeah, the back that's portion. Where you can see the, the, the guy wires, the yellow covered and the white covered guy wires. There were, when we first yeah. bought the property, that tree was right there. It was actually two trees. Um, and so the first thing we did was cut down those trees and get rid of them very early in the project. And then you can see the, the very large hump in the backyard that was right there just a few feet from the street. So we moved those guy wires over and you, from the, the first picture to the second, you can see the guy wires are a little closer together. That's, mm. That was after they were moved. They were able to actually put a brand new power pole there, which was stronger and better. And so they could tighten them up even a little bit more. And so where that tree is, if you look a little to the left, you can see the power box. That's pretty much the edge of our property. So from there over to um, just on the other side of the new guy wires is where the driveway ended up being. So we really had to move oh, those wow. otherwise there would have been nowhere for anybody to park since they wouldn't let us do anything in the front yard. Right, so the, from the first picture that we saw with the garage there, so you moved right. parking to the back, so excellent. Right. So we closed in the garage to make that living space, which also helped our ARV tremendously because it added another 340 square feet-ish. It was a nice big size garage. And so that gave us a really wonderful laundry room and family mm -hmm. room. Excellent, great problem solving. So that's incredible. Let's go to the next slide, Buffy. <clears throat> so now I wanna talk a little bit about the interior. So you said you were the fourth owner. I mean, there had to be some foolishness going on in this house, right? <laughs> well, I think since the first one was 2006, I think they must have gotten hit with the crash and maybe they ran out of money. I don't really I know. Um, and then I think that it just, it's a big project, you know, and I, I love a challenge. I like the things that are the hardest. So it doesn't scare me at all. To me, this, you know, it's easier to be able to come in at this stage and move things around um, and, and finish it. And then I can finish it the way I want to. So that first picture you're looking at top and bottom is that was the garage where all those cabinets are sitting. And that oh, so wow. it's now the living room with the laundry room and HVAC room. Um, and then the middle is the um, master bathroom uh, before and after. And then the final picture, when you're looking in the front door, right in the middle of the house was where the kitchen was. We moved it to the back of the house because it really, it left a lot of, of open space that you couldn't do much with. So by moving the kitchen into that back sort of left corner, which we, where we have a, a door, um, gave us a nice size kitchen and then a, mm -hmm. a nice um, dining area there, as well as a foyer area. Excellent. So time-wise, were there any issues or delays with contractors? A lot of times when we have our dud presenters come in, that's a big hurdle uh, that most people can't clear. So how did that go for you? Um, I didn't have too many problems with contractors. I had problems with my first partner, uh, oh. which is why I had it for so long. And um, a close friend, and we've done other jobs together, it was just, he was super busy. And he was one of my main contacts for vendors. And so we had, um, it was actually my brother and one other gentleman. And so it, it just, we could never get in the schedule. Um, and so finally, after a year of sitting there, and I had done the other project that y'all saw, I think a couple months ago with Elliot, yes. uh, the third house. So after mm -hmm. that, one, I was sitting there one day and I said, you know what, I can just buy them out and let's get this property finished because it, it, we just really hadn't done anything. So that's what we did. And so once I took over the project, which was in January of uh, last year, 20, it took me from January until um, May to get it done. And um, okay. All right. too many, that was kind of, you know, we, we were doing it all through COVID, which was for us was not a really a problem. I have um, a close group of contractors. And so the people that I work with all the time, and so we're all pretty careful. And so we were able to get moving and get things going. And, and um, the permitting was really not difficult. As I said, the county worked with us. Sure. So we didn't really have any other delays. We passed our inspections. Um, 
It was just a matter of taking the time and, and getting it done. Excellent. So with that, let's go to the money slide. We, based on your pictures, we know you did well. So, all right. Very good. So the living room that in the garage. Yeah, I must say this house and the house that you did with Elliot, your design eye is like fantastic. Like people are probably just threw their wallets at you when they were walking through the house. <laughs> uh, well, appreciate that. Well, the first house Elliot and I staged with um, a friend who is a stager. This one I use systematic home staging um, because I just I wanted to get it done and get out. And they so they did a really nice job um, making it look great. And it was it had did have a couple of strange spaces. And um, to be honest, I didn't really think that I had that great of a design eye. So I have to have somebody else come in and, and do that part. But once I get started, then I'm pretty good to go. Sure. But, Thank you. I appreciate that. And I did want to make it usable because, you know, it, nowadays with so many people staying home all day, working at home, having family come live with them. Um, this room, we were able to stage it with a little desk and an office on that back wall. So you had room and the, there's, it's a huge room. You could, you could have added in, we could have made it another bedroom. Um, yeah. and we just wanted, you know, and it, so it was available to do that. So it was pretty, pretty fun to do. That's great. So it sounds like you're quite forward thinking. Um, with the design and some of the architectural things that you did, like enclosing the garage and like you said, making more space for really, you know, virtual times that we live in now. So you think that really impacted your, your ARV at the end of the day and helped it get sold quicker? I think so, because we really had to overcome the fact that it was a tiny lot. It was in a weird location. Yeah. Um, Airport Boulevard is a fairly busy street. Um, Bungalow is. is the side street is is very quiet and the neighbors are wonderful um, and it and airport is not we're at the far end we're not near the airport itself we're about five miles away so it, it wasn't that bad but it's almost to H.E. Williamson Parkway which is also kind of busy mm -hmm. but the benefit is we were very close to the 417 so our location was really pretty good um, but I still had to overcome those things um, that there it was the first new build in a long 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 time and we knew we wanted to, you know, uh, make sure that we could offer something to people. I couldn't put a garage on, there was no room for a garage. So we had to have the parking pad. And so we had to overcome those things. And so to do that, we needed extra living space. We needed an indoor garage, I I'm sorry, indoor laundry room yeah. and just, you know, comfortable living spaces for families. That's incredible. Awesome. And you did a great job. If we were on stage, I'd have everybody applauding right now because okay. this is, this is really, really good. So excellent, excellent job. Any issues with closing? I always like to bring that up because a lot of times there can be issues. No, no closing. Well, actually that's not true. We did, we, we went on the market and after, um, it was funny because that was during the height of all of the multiple offers and people going crazy. <laughs> right. We, I didn't have any offers for a week hmm. and people kept telling me, Actually, agents were telling me, oh, we know you're going to get a lot of offers. So our, our client doesn't want to get into a bidding war. So we're not going to offer. So that oh my was, gosh. I thought that was just crazy. But finally, um, we did get a full price offer. And um, I had, because I was a little concerned about the appraisal, you know, you never know these days. Right. Uh, I had asked them to put in a um, uh, uh, condition that they would pay up to 5000 over the appraised value because I didn't want to have to put it back on the part on the market. And so they did and everything was fine. Well, that was on a Friday. On Monday, they called and um, it was a, um, somebody who had, had family um, in a different country and they had had some kind of family problem and they had to back out of the deal on Monday. So wow. um, actually that was Sunday afternoon. So I had my backup. I did end up getting uh, four offers. At, okay. They had nothing. And then all of a sudden I had four offers. Called the backup offer and they said, yes, we want it. So we had it back under contract on Monday. And then everything went smoothly after that, no problems, the same deal. So we, um, and so we got 30,000 more than we thought we would, um, or sorry, 40,000 more. And, um, and everything was great. They had appraised at full value, which we were super excited about. And um, everything was great. And I was really fortunate again, because I didn't have to borrow the money we had cash. And so holding it all that time, I didn't have the extra holding costs of interest payment, which is huge. So that was a big deal, um, which, you know, which made it much easier to to um, have to hold it that long, even though I didn't want to. Great. And we did have a quick question that came in. Uh, when did you close? So maybe 
let's talk about the time frame from when you put it on the market to you got things kind of situated with this final buyer. What was that timing? Um, let's see. We we closed in, um, and you know, I probably had my time frames messed up. I'm I have a hard time with times when I'm working on several projects. I'm gonna say uh, so many projects. Oh man. <laughs> we closed, um, this is August. We closed. And I was, I told you wrong. It wasn't last year we did it. It was this year we did it. It was January of this year that we started it. Finished in May and we closed in June. Okay. Yeah. Right, so we yeah. had 19 through the, through the end of 20. And that was when I was working on the other one. So I had it almost two years. I had the property almost two years. Got it. Holding, kind of holding on to it before you took it to exactly. this level. Exactly. So in January of this year is when we started it and then finished it in May and closed in June. Excellent. All right, last slide. So this is opportunity for questions. Uh, I always like to ask just to kind of get things uh, rolling here. What did you enjoy most about the deal? This, you know, this whole process, what did you enjoy? Like I said, I like a challenge and I like to be able yeah. to play with things and play with the floor plans and make them work to you know what I think is usable. I'm a cook. I'm, I love to cook. And so kitchens are really important to me. I want it to be functional and have all the space that somebody needs. And so um, even in this tiny kitchen, little short galley kitchen, we were able to put a, a lot of space and a lot of it's comfortable space. Um, I, I really am learning to love the design part of it where I, like I said, I didn't think I was very good at it, but it's fun to go out there and try to put things together that um, they, that the masses will like. So um, I just enjoyed the challenge of getting it done. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. So let me see. We've got a couple questions here. <clears throat> Let's see. What? Okay. I'm just going to read it off because I'm trying to. So it says, <laughs> what happened that the house had to be gutted if built in 2006? You mentioned the house was newer. Why the plumbing, electrical, and what was the specific numbers on that? So I guess the construction started in 2006. And uh, it looks, well, I guess really what was the condition, right? So what had they? It was not gutted. It, it, the construction okay. started, it got to the framing stage. They had, they had had a, um, your, the first rough in plumbing inspection and that was it. That's when it stopped. Oh, so all so, the walls were open and everything just like the pictures. Exactly how you saw those framing pictures. That's what it looked like when I got it. So the only gutting we did was moving the um, uh, kitchen from where it was. We gutted some, we had to cut some new uh, plumbing in the floor and add, we, ha we did have to pull out all the, the electrical because they had run electrical, mm -hmm. but never get it inspected. And it was all wrong and badly done anyway. So there was duct work from the HVAC and there was the electrical. So we pulled all of that out. The plumbing we were able to use and then we just added because we had moved the, the laundry a little bit and we had moved the kitchen to the outer part. So we had to change that. We took, there was a tub in the master bath. We took that out and made it a shower. So we had to change the, the drain. Um, and so- oh. You know, just yeah, just some things like that to make it more for our our current living. Got it. <clears throat> Sounds great. Uh, I think this person was confused. I think they got our pictures mixed up. <laughs> they were like, "Why did you keep the garage door on if you closed it in?" But but you didn't. No, that was the old picture. That was what it looked like when I bought it. It had the garage door and it it looked finished from the outside. Yeah, and and that's what caused me so much confusion. It looked like a finished house. I'm like, how did these people get in here? Exactly. So, very confusing. And uh, let's see, last question. What, uh, people love your design. What kind of floor was installed? <laughs> uh, that was a tile floor, a, a porcelain tile from Floor and Decor. It oh. 89 cents a square foot. Awesome, on clearance? No, they have it right now. 80, I think it's 85 or 89 cents. It's called Modelo Gray. I love it, it's wonderful. All it's right. a 12 by 24 tile, it looks really high end. And um, yeah, Let's it's- find my credit card. I do like to buy things very inexpensively. I don't spend a lot of money on my design um, because you know you can go crazy with that stuff. And um, I try to find a, a higher end look as cheaply as I can. And so I'll shop and and try to try to not spend very much. Excellent. I'm gonna invite you over to my house when we start our rehab here. So this is excellent. Absolutely, I'll be glad to. All right. Awesome. Uh, all right, guys. Well. All of Lisa's information is right here on the screen. It's been up for quite some time, so hurry and get your screenshots now. Uh, and with that, Lisa, thank you. This has been incredible. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no problem. All right. Now we're moving on to our dud of the month. Jason, are you there? 
Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Stephen. How are you, buddy? Good. How's it going, Jason? Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, this is my dud. This is my one and only dud. All right. So <laughs> we're going to dive into it. So the, we called this one, or you called it rather, the lessons learned. So I, I think with each slide, I'm going to try to pull out what is that lesson that you learned. So let's start from the beginning. Um, so just to be clear, people are probably a little confused. This property is in Rhode Island. Correct. Yes. Right. Rhode Island. That, that's where I'm originally from. I'm, I'm new to Orlando about a year and a half ago. Right. Um, but uh, so I did most of my business and most of my learning in Rhode Island. That's where I'm originally from. All right. Excellent. So time frame on this deal. When did you, I guess, when did it come across your desk or how did you find it? So I just, so a little bit of the backstory is I was, okay. uh, I decided I was going to get into real estate and, you know, wholesaling and flipping and eventually buy and hold back in 2005. So I started learning. And then in 2000, it was uh, probably early 2006 or so, I came across a, my first wholesale deal and I wholesaled it, made 10,000. I said, I can do this. Let me do a flip now. Okay. So a realtor, local realtor that I had hooked up with, uh, this, this deal had come on the market. And this was uh, about uh, April or May of 2006. And uh, so he brought it to me. We made an offer. They kind of offered in, and we ended up agreeing on a, on a purchase price. So I got it through a realtor. It was on the MLS. Okay. Got it through a realtor. Um, mm -hmm. The question I was going to ask about this is how much did education play into a factor in your decision making? So you said you had just recently kind of started, felt mm -hmm. pretty confident. Do you think that maybe you would have done things a bit differently if you had gotten additional advice or how did that play out? Yeah, I think I think I think part of the problem was I was while I I thought I knew what I was doing. I didn't I didn't have a mentor or anyone that I could uh, call and ask advice on. Um, that was the biggest problem. I, I don't I don't even do that to this day, even with the experience I have now. I still look for other people's advice. But with this project and the purchase of it and everything, I didn't I didn't reach out to anyone. Oh, wow. And this is my first and this is my first deal. And, um, you know, the, the, that's why it's my dud of the month, I guess. Right. So that, that, that's a lesson right there is look, you know, especially if you're new, mm -hmm. reach out to people. Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, do you mind coming in, taking a look at this deal and tell me what your thoughts are on what I should do in the, you know, how, it, when, not only when they're uh, after you bought it, but before you bought it, you know, are right. you paying the right price? And so that was a lesson learned there. And, and it's um, those lessons I still use. Even to this day, even though I've been doing this for 16 years now. Great. Excellent. Appreciate that. So next slide, Buffy. So this home appears to be a little older. What was the condition of the home and how old is this home? Uh, it was built, I, if I remember right, I think it was 1910. Uh, you got to remember up in the Northeast, obviously, homes are a lot older right. than, than some, of the, some of the homes here. So uh, it, even a home built in 1910 really isn't that old it sounds old oh, in florida like ancient for us man <laughs> yeah Shoot. but but up there it's actually not that bad um so it, it was it was pretty much kind of how you see it except the picture on the left there or on the right i should say um the walls were white uh it was stained it didn't have the hardwood it did have hardwood those hardwood floors however they were they were under a couple layers of uh, vinyl tile and um so so here's another lesson I learned. If you got, if you have um, hardwood floors in a home, even if there's tile on it, get rid of that tile, rip it up, and put and get those uh, those original hardwood floors exposed. And I didn't do that. I didn't know that. I didn't ask oh. anybody for their opinion. I didn't know. I said, "Oh, I'm just going to go right over this." I ended up putting twelve by twelve, another layer of twelve by twelve vinyl tiles over. The, uh, the, it was actually sheet vinyl that was there over the hardwood floors. I went over the sheet vinyl with more vinyl. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I knew the that there was gas. Yeah, the exactly. like, oh, no. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, I knew there was hardwoods under there because you could see, um, you know, when they lay the glue on the sheet vinyl, you can see how it makes the grooves in the hardwoods underneath. And I said, Oh, look, there must be hardwoods under here. That's pretty cool. Let me go over it again. And so I went over it again. <laughs> And uh, so that was a mess. And, and this picture here that you're seeing actually is not my picture. So um, here's another lesson learned is do before and after pictures. Um, uh, you know, obviously, Lisa did that with hers, which is great. And this is my first go round. And I didn't do that. 
So the picture you see on the left, that's actually a picture of when I had a tenant in there. We'll get to that. Um, the picture on the right was, is from uh, the person that I sold it to who took pictures and they, and they listed it and they sold a house uh, just actually just recently. So I'm actually using their picture of, on the right. Um, so that, that's another lesson learned is document what you're doing when you're flipping these houses. And, yep. um, mm -hmm. and I didn't do that. Again, this is, I was so raw and so out on my own, thought I knew what I was doing and I was wrong. And, you know, I don't want to keep, you know, poking you here, but people are going to ask these numbers. The purchase price was 177 and yeah. Hmm. What, what, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. So, so you got to remember back in 2006, this was prior to the crash. Right. Yep. And so I thought I was, Hey, look, the market's going up. I'm riding the wave. And, and at that time we thought it was worth maybe 235, 240 at the time. Oh, wow. So, so I bought at 177 and started making some, just kind of cleaning it up, did some fresh paint, put, put that new floor in, put some cheapo appliances in there. That appliance you see on the left of the range, I, I put that in. Um, and by the time I had it ready to sell, the market had already started going down. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't, I couldn't get anyone to make an offer anywhere near what we had listed it for. And every time I would lower the price, um, uh, every time I lower the price, the market kept dropping and I couldn't keep up with the price with the, with the market dropping. Market so, so wow. eventually got to the, eventually got to the point where I was, I was underwater here. And so uh, that leads to the next part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll get to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the repairs. So you kind of already touched a little bit on the repairs that were done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, next slide, Buffy. So obviously, well, I mean, it was your first go round, so it doesn't sound like mm -hmm. you were trying to do any major renovation like what we just saw. So, I mean, how, how did that go? Was it just budget restraints or again, were you just so new to it, you weren't sure how to really get started? No, I think, I think it, it, at that time, you gotta remember it was similar to what it is now where you could almost grab a house, clean it up and put it back in the market and make $20,000. Got it. So I thought that's what I was gonna do. And, um, and so, you know, when we talk about lessons learned, um, that's actually one of the biggest lessons here is, um, you know, how much work are you going to do in the house and what are you going to sell it for? So what I thought I was going to do is I was just going to clean it up and sell it for the top of the market. And you can't do that even with a house that, that you just kind of cleaned up because and, and, and today it, was, it has a lot of similarities to that time where um, the buyers at that time were, were starting to get more and more savvy with what they were looking for. And so I wasn't selling a house that, that, that was uh, comparable to homes that were selling at top of the market. I was selling a house that had lower quality um, appliances, uh, lower quality flooring. Um, and, uh, you know, the kitchen wasn't updated, only had one bathroom, unfinished basement that was a dungeon. So it wasn't, it wasn't comparable to homes that were selling at the top of the market. And I thought I was going to sell it at the top of the market. And, and that's another lesson that I learned. And, and I, again, I took, we talk about more, more about that as well. All right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a great point to point out for a lot of new investors that join mm -hmm. these meetings. Uh, understand your market and understand the amount of work that it takes to get to those prices, right? It, yes. Yeah. It doesn't just simply happen, you know, overnight. So yeah, yeah compare aren't just looking at, okay, here's a house, same square footage, same neighborhood that sold for this price. It's not just that. You have to look at the finishes. True. You know, you have to look at what's been done inside the house. Is it a modern kitchen or semi-modern kitchen? You know, if it is, then you have to compete with that or you have to sell it at a lower price point. And um, so you can see here, some, you know, some of the stuff that I did. Uh, and it's interesting because the garage demo and the roof, that was all done, you know, 10 years after I bought it. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I did that work, but it was way later. I did do the landscaping. Uh, I, 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 I did reglaze a shower. Uh, I put a new steam boiler in there. And that's another thing, too, is, that, you know, I probably should have put a new, new heating system in there. Instead, I just put the old, another just steam boiler in there. Oh, you're freezing those people, man. <laughs> yeah, it was just, um, you know, it was just one mistake after another. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, 
so a, lot, be, a, lot, a lot of things are wrong. So to be clear, we're, we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. So some of these repairs that you alluded to were done throughout the time period that you ended up holding on to the property uh, and making repairs, right? So you said you, you couldn't sell it because the market was dipping, so you decided to rent? Correct, yeah. So, so I, I kept it for, uh, oh boy, about 11 years. I sold it um, 2017. I bought it 06, sold it in 2017. And I, so I had it rented for all that time. So uh, I ended up um, in, right when I was getting ready to list it, I put a new roof on it because uh, it needed a roof. And, uh, you know, 10 years earlier, I probably could have got away with the same roof. But now it's 10 years later yeah. and the roof just doesn't make it anymore. So I ended up putting a new roof on there. And in that 10 year time, uh, the garage was really kind of in disrepair. And I kind of just tried to put lipstick on it. But the neighbor across the street who had connections at the city ended up calling the city. And I, and I received a, a citation from the city to either repair uh -huh. the, the garage or demo it. And after some thought, I just decided just to demo it. Okay. So um, I, I want to I wanna bring up what, what the... Um, the big lesson here. Oh, actually, you know what? If you want to talk about this, I'll, I'll talk about the big lesson on the next slide. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So what, what I was going to say here is that, you know, the big lesson here that I learned from this project um, that I still use this day is how I rehab houses. Mm. So I'm not, I, you know, I'm looking to sell houses when I flip them. I don't care about going all out, making my house look like HGTV okay. and, and trying to sell for, or trying to reset the market at a higher level and keep pushing, keep pushing. I, I don't really care for that. I'm trying to make money and I want to sell today. So what I learned from this house and the biggest lesson I got from this is that if you, if you buy a house, fix it up. So it looks as close as you can to what's on the highest, at the highest, um, uh, comparables okay. and list it at a lower price, you will attract so many buyers that your um, that your uh, you, you might even get uh, offers over asking. So that's actually what happened here with this house. So I sold it for one sixty five, but I listed it for one fifty nine, oh, really? and I had you know, I had multiple offers over asking, and I said, oh my god, I said this house isn't even. <laughs> this, this, this house isn't even like uh, it's like I know, what I, I know what I did to this house yeah, it's not even all that fixed <laughs> up and, right. and it's not even all that fixed up but I set at a lower price so what does that tell me there is a huge pool of buyers in any market that is looking for value mm. so, so this house at that 159 price point even when the market was kind of on its way up but it was still kind of plateaued uh, there were so many buyers looking for value in a home that if you price it right, you're still going to get multiple offers. So yeah. I took that lesson. And when I buy houses now and I rehab them, I still use that lesson. I try to buy it at the right price. I make the right amount of repairs, right amount of cosmetic upgrades to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I still try to price it in a, at a price point where I can, I can expand and have a, 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 a the largest pool of buyers that I can have so that I can sell that property quickly. And I still use that strategy to this day. Uh, I still sell houses quickly, usually in the first weekend or within the first week. And I still make plenty of money. And, 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 you know, so I try to, I try to tell this to as many newbies as possible because mm -hmm. a lot of newbies watch too much TV. And I'm sorry, I know that's kind of a derogatory term. <laughs> <laughs> newbies is, <laughs> I should say new investors. I should say new investors, but yeah, no. um, I, I try to tell that to, to new investors because a lot, of these, a lot of people who are new, they watch a lot of TV and they're like, hey, I can, I can make a house look like that. And the market's so strong and I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna make so much money. But at some point mm -hmm. you're gonna get caught. You might get away with that for a little bit. At some point, you're going to get caught. It's not always going to work like that. So, you know, try to gauge, you know, wh what is your strategy here? You're, you're, are you trying to sell a house or are you trying to make as much as you can and you will and take a loss? I don't want to take any more losses for me. And so, especially if you're new, you know, it, it, and you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of resources, you don't have a lot behind you. If you're trying to sell at the 
top of the market, you get caught, you're in big trouble. Um, so fortunately, I was able to to ride the wave here for about, um, you know, 10, 11 about years. 10 years, yeah. Yeah, I still took a loss because um, at the time, rents weren't what they were today. So I was still, every month I was selling it. I was renting it. Even at a loss, I was taking money out of pocket. Yeah, so was, that holding I saw there, I was like, uh-oh. So, yeah, I mean that that that's that that's mortgages. I I had a mortgage, yep. mm. so so j- you have to be careful. Try to sell, especially if you're new. Try to sell to at a price point where you can attract as many buyers as possible. You want to have a huge pool of buyers, so that you don't get stuck like I did here. And I don't ever want to get stuck with something like this again. So, you know, uh, and so so that that that's the biggest lesson that I learned is that. You don't have to go crazy. You just have to provide value to, to buyers here. Um, and obviously, every location is different. Every market's different. Um, but but the, the, the value option is the same everywhere. And so I, I, I still use that to this day. Great. I hope that makes yeah. sense. No, it does. And that was going to be okay. you know, one of my questions. What, and you kind of answered it, what's the difference you see? Because somebody may say, oh, well, that's Rhode Island problems, right? Yeah. You know, but we're here in Florida. So, you know, you're basically stating that the same rules will apply. It's just the market may be slightly different uh, as far as price point or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, it's um, it doesn't really matter what city you're in or anything. It's yeah. the same basic rules that apply. And, and, and again, it's, look, buy, you have to buy right. You have to know what you're, you know, how much yep. you can do in repairs. But then you have to ask yourself, look, what am I trying to accomplish here? Am I, am I going to be HGTV and try to try to <laughs> set the market at a new level? And if you want to, God bless you, man, go for it. Go, go yeah, get sure. it. Right, right. Or are you trying to sell? Are you trying to sell and make money? Right. And right. that's right. what right. I'm right. trying to do. Yeah. And I'm not trying to get caught like I did with this one ever again. And, uh, so, so just ask yourself that question. What are you trying to do? And if you're trying to sell and make money, know what the price point is that you have to be at that might be slightly below what other people are selling at, but your house is still comparable. Mm-hmm. You're going to bring in a lot of buyers. You're going to get multiple offers and you're going to sell it quickly. So that's what I do now. Excellent. Love it. All right, let's go to the last slide. And there was a question that came up. Uh, let's see here. Ask the question, when was the closing date or contract date? I'm not sure if they'd want to know when you got it under contract. Well, we said back in 06. I guess, when did you sell it? So we sold it. It was, oh, I'm trying to remember the exact date, but it was it was early 2017. So it might have been May or June 2017, something like that, is when I ended up selling it. And I bought it around the same time in 2006. So I rented it for a long time. And oh, here's, a, here's another mistake. Oh, one other lesson learned is I bought mm-hmm. this house under my personal name. So I now have, I now I, I was carrying that mortgage oh. under, under my personal name. So, um, so just, to, a little, just to fill in a little bit here, around that time in 2016, 2017 um, was when I decided I was getting, gonna get back into full-time real estate, uh, um, a, a full-time real estate investor. Because uh, for the, um, I was I had a full time job, so I was only kind of doing the side. And then at that time, I when I said, okay, I'm going to get a full time real estate investor again, uh, the, my lenders were like, hey, you've got this other mortgage. What is oh, this? Boy. And I said, oh, it's just it's an investment property. Well, we can't lend to you. <laughs> I was like, oh crap. So I ended up uh, I ended up just selling it, and I took a loss, like you saw. Um, and so the other lesson learned is uh, don't ever take mortgages or buy property under your personal name. Make sure you're buying under an LLC uh, and including the mortgages. Have that separation. So Have the separation, yeah. This question came in. Usually I ask this, but I guess I missed it. What motivated you to keep investing after the deal? So you said you jumped back in shortly after you sold this property. What, what, what motivated you? What made you want to keep doing this after all the hardship you've gone through? Well, it, it was the same motivation that got me started at that time in the first place is that um, I don't, I don't want to rely on um, 401ks and social security and all this stuff for my retirement. I, I, I want financial freedom. 
And I think at that time, I, I knew I wanted the time and I knew that real estate was the answer for me. I said, the way I'm going to do it to get my financial freedom is through real estate. So, and so I, I was, I had to fire my belly. This is how I'm going to do it. Unfortunately, with this deal, <laughs> my first deal, I was probably a little too uh, impulsive or uh, maybe not impulsive, but I just didn't, um, I, I just didn't, I just, I just didn't go through the process the right way in terms of, you know, having consulting with people and, and, and understanding the market and how to, how to, how to rehab a property. Sure. So I jumped, I jumped the gun a little bit on that. Um, but, but throughout that time, I still had that fire and I still knew that real estate was my way out. And it was right around that time that I actually just got married and I, we started having kids and we started having a family. So I needed a full-time job. So sure. I got a full-time job as a property manager for a third party company. Oh, okay. So, so I did that for, for a number of years as we built a family, but the time was coming again. I knew that real estate was my answer. And I had bought, I had bought a rental property in, uh, during those years. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to get uh, out of working for a company again, got out of the corporate world and uh, become a full-time investor again. So, so that's what I did. And so around that time I said, okay, I'm going back in. And uh, the lender's like, you, you got to get this house out of your name. So I sold this one, and once I sold that, it just exploded from there. So it was sky's, it, the, limit. It, sky's the limit, and and it yeah. was financial freedom, like most people are, and that that's what I want, and that's what I uh, I go after every single day. It's I wake up and go to bed with that on my mind every All day. Right. Excellent. Well, well said. I have nothing else to add to that, <laughs> uh, Jason. This has been incredible, and we really appreciate you. You know having the opportunity, giving us the opportunity to hear about your deal and telling the membership. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid to get out here and, you know, talk, you know, you didn't do so hot. Right. So I did, people get I did terrible. I did terrible. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, listen, if for anybody who's new or listening, I love sharing my experience with other people and especially new people who, um, who just want to meet one-on-one -on -one with someone. And so if anybody wants to meet with me or contact me, feel free to reach out and I'd love to grab a cup of coffee with you and, and, you know, I'm a realtor now in Florida. It's because um, a lot of people in my network in Rhode Island now call me to uh, find deals for them here in, in Florida, uh, buying old stuff. Yeah. yeah so, I, so I got my license to do that. So I call myself the investor-friendly realtor. And so I love to use my experience to help new investors uh, when they're going to go look at their first property or anything like that. I'm happy to go with you and, and tell you what I see, tell you what I think. Sure. And so you, so you don't have to make the same mistake that I made with this deal here. Um, I'm willing to reach out and help anybody I can who, who's an investor. So awesome. I'm happy to do that. Great. Well, we appreciate that. So with that, thank you, Jason. And uh, Jay, it's off to you. Awesome. Thank you again to both Lisa and Jason. And uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with some of those things that Jason said more. And, and I really like, uh, Jason, your comment there at the end about how important it is to, to be able to help some of the new investors. And, and that's one of the things I love about CFRI that was such a shock to me the first time that I encountered it is all these people that are so willing to help. And it, and it is. It's a great function of what CFRI, CFRI is here for. And part of the way that you see who's doing these deals and learn about it and can share that information is obviously, as you just saw, deal of the month, dud of the month. So whether it's a deal, whether it's a dud, if you have one of those, please do reach out to Stephen and let him know about it. And as you can see, it's a very simple, informal process where we learn about your deal. And even if it's a dud, we're going to learn something. Obviously, Jason learned some great stuff doing that. And uh, I, I can certainly sympathize with a lot of that because I had one that took place about the same time that had a lot of similarity. It wasn't a Rhode Island, but had a lot of a lot of similarities to that where, you know, you go in and you think, oh, I'm going to do this, this, this. And you learn very quickly. Maybe you don't need to do all that. So, uh, yeah, lot, very, very good points. Thank you, Jason. All right. Uh, moving on to our next slide, Buffy. Again, just a reminder, we're going to go into our uh, panel discussion now with our five great panelists, but uh, don't forget, if, uh, if you are a CFRI member to partake of the meeting after the meeting, it is, again, a separate Zoom login link. If you haven't registered for it, make sure you head over to CFRI.net and register for that. I believe Buffy also posted that in the, uh, the, the link to it in the chat, so you can get directly to it if you're not already registered. 
But, uh, but again, please do because, you know, again, that is one of those places where you can learn some of that information and draw from experience, meet a few new people and add some more people to your contact list so that you do have uh, more people to draw on for experience and ask questions and so on. All right, tonight's panel discussion, we're going to spend about the next 53, four minutes, something like that, talking about are your real estate assets prepared for a natural disaster? And hopefully we don't have anything like Hurricane Ida headed our way anytime soon, but we know that we live in Florida and we know that we live in an area where there's a lot of warm water on pretty much all sides, almost. So it goes without saying that uh, we certainly attract plenty of hurricanes. And that's just one example of types of things that can go wrong in our area, but certainly one that is definitely on our minds. Now, tonight we are joined by five outstanding panelists. We're going to be talking to Mark Orman. We're going to be talking to Colleen Pacheco. We're going to be talking to Larry Arnett and Jeremiah Ofori and Elliot Grime. So uh, welcome all of our panelists. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here and being part of our panel tonight. And what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll go around and uh, call on each one of you as uh, that way we can kind of keep an eye on who's going when and whatnot. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, get you to introduce yourself to our Zoom audience so they know who you are and uh, kind of what you're, a um, uh, little bit about you real quickly. So let's start, let's see with um, Larry, I believe you're first on my screen. So if you would unmute yourself and tell everybody uh, who you are. Okay, yeah, my name is Larry Arnett. I'm with Five Star Claims Adjusting. We're based here in Orlando, our office is in Maitland. And uh, we, we have 25 adjusters in our Orlando office. Uh, we offer an 11 point inspection for homeowners free of charge. And, um, you know, we, we, we like to uh, help homeowners, help uh, investors, uh, you know, work, work with uh, insurance claims start to finish A to Z. Um, that, that's basically what we do in a nutshell. But, but our inspection, again, is totally free. And, and the, the thing I love about what we do is is if we don't win your claim, we don't get paid. So um, there's, there's, we don't charge for our service unless we get paid. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Jeremiah, you're next on my screen, so we'll go to you next. Thanks, Jeremiah Ofori. I am the mold or damage restoration uh, specialist, what I like to say. Uh, we focus in mold remediation slash water damage um, we do all of the remediation and rebuild um, for residential or commercial properties. Um, so we can deal with those, uh, those insurance companies after Larry get it and help with the estimates to rebuild it. Excellent. Very good to know. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mark, how about you? Uh, you're on mute, Mark. <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Yep. How's that? You hear me okay yep. now? Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. No, no worries. Listening to everybody else, it's interesting. But yeah, my name's Mark Orman. I'm a roofing contractor. I'm also a general contractor. Um, a lot of people buy houses and uh, they have to change the roof out in order to sell them. Uh, it's very difficult to sell a house unless the roof, you can prove the roof is within maybe a year or two at the most. Because once it goes to like five, six years, um, the new buyers, they, they don't want to spend that much money because they're afraid that they're going to have to replace the roof. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's, uh, uh, so I do a little bit of everything. I'm mostly focused on roofs, but like I said, I'm a general contractor as well. Excellent. Great. So glad to have you with us. Thanks, Mark. Elliot, how about you? Hello, everybody. My name is Elliot. I'm the owner operator of VE Builders. We specialize in turnkey flips of homes, uh, feet on the ground. A lot of our renovations are pretty extensive, uh, repipes, rewires, roofs, some mold work with Jeremiah sometimes if they're too bad. Um, and I actually started this whole career back when Andrew hit many, many years ago and as a teenager and started knocking down wet drywall and putting shingles on roofs and all that. So uh, hurricane is actually my, uh, my entry point to this career. Okay. That's uh, that seems very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And last, but certainly not least at all, Colleen, how about you? Hi, 
Hello, everybody. I'm Colleen. I'm with Secured Insurance Group. I'm an insurance agent, so I'm the one that helps all these <laughs> great people be able to work in some sense. But I've been doing this for a little over 20 years, and uh, right now it's very challenging. But I am glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Colleen. All right, so we are going to uh, kind of go make the rounds here. And um, one of the things that uh, we will encourage everybody to do as we finish up is for each of our panelists to provide their contact info in uh, in the chat. So um, I, I will try to remind everybody to do that. But if, you, if you've got a few minutes as we're going along, I know everybody's going to want to know, hey, how do I get a hold of you in case I have a question? And, uh, and, and we will we'll want to make sure everybody has that. Uh, as we do go around the room and ask some questions, uh, if our audience has some questions that they would like asked, please make sure and put those in the Q&A panel. That way we can see those. And uh, if we have a couple extra minutes, maybe even get to some of those and uh, make sure that we get some of your questions answered. So I will kind of just go around the room here and ask a few questions of each person, get some input, because I, I know there's Obviously, when it comes to natural disasters, there are a lot of things that we need to A, know about so that we can be prepared for them, and then B, some of the, the steps that we need to take. What is it we actually need to do so that we are prepared for them? And heaven forbid, step three, then, you know, what do we do it once, once that happens? So um, let's start going back up here to, uh, to Larry for a moment. Um, Larry, you know, for our CFI group, for our members, um, how how is it that we should prepare a like a disaster recovery plan? What what's the best way that we can do something like that to be prepared, be best prepared for a, a natural disaster? Well, I think I think the first thing is uh, for any disaster plan is you got to put something in writing. Um, you know, to think it and and have it in the back of your mind doesn't do any good. You got to put it in writing. Um, you know, as far as, as evacuations and things like that, you need to know where to go, how far to go. Um, you know, unfortunately, some of these unpredictable storms, I remember back, you know, in 05, 06, uh, you know, the, the West Coast came here and then the storm turned and came here, but those are not typical. So, um, you know, you need to know whether to evacuate, you need to have all your important documents, whether it's insurance papers, bank accounts, et cetera, um, cash, um, a lot of people don't think about cash, but bottom line is if the electric goes out and there's no electricity, then there's no ATMs. There's obviously no banks open. The ATMs don't have power. So that's another issue. Um, you know, things like prescription medication and, and survival items, uh, water, flashlight, that kind of stuff. Those are all things that, um, you know, can be found on multiple different websites. Everybody's kind of got their own version of a survival plan. And um, you can also go to um, homeland.gov and they do have an outline there of a, uh, of a, a um, putting your plan into, into writing so that it kind of gives you some, some starting steps on, on how to work your plan. Now, you know, as far as an investor, um, if you have multiple investment properties, it's always a good idea to, you know, know who your tenants are, uh, have their contact information so that in a situation where, uh, you know, a natural disaster, as an example, were to hit Orlando, um, you need to know how to contact your, uh, you know, tenants and, um, you know, whether it be via cell phone or however that's going to be. So, um, you know, that, that, that's a good starting point. But I think more than anything, it's the fact that you have to write it down. You've got to put your plan into action by putting it in writing. I, I could not agree with you more in my, uh, my other life. I do IT security and, and that is one of the biggest things that we tell any of the companies when it comes to disaster recovery is you can say you have one, but until it's in writing and until you've thought through it and tested it out, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't really have one. And uh, I, you know, it's interesting, you, you pointed out thinking ahead for things like cash and ATMs. And, you know, I, I bet almost every one of us has done this before. We get so used to what will be there or what will work. And, you know, the power goes out in your house. I guarantee you almost every one of us has walked through and flipped that switch to turn the light on when the power's out and went, oh yeah, it doesn't work. You know, it, we, we take so much for granted. So 
the only way you're going to do that, like you said, I agree. Have it in writing. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, uh, Jeremiah. Um, so being a mold remediation expert, one of the things that I, I find myself asking all the time, especially when I go in a, play, uh, in a house or a property and I'm looking around, I'm thinking, well, it seems like there's some water damage, has kind of a funky smell, but you know, how can you really tell if a house has mold? So the number one way to really tell without a doubt is to get it tested, right? Um, some of that mold or moisture or musky smell can be other things. It can be dander from cats. It can be, you know, old dogs, um, you know, urine. But to really get it tested to see what type of mold it is, which is obviously important too, is to get it tested. And so by law for, for us, although I'm a licensed mold remediator, there's, there's also a licensed mold assessor. And they, they really are the ones who assess what type of mold you have and how vicious it is. Um, so that is the number one the way to do it. But you know, one of the telltale signs that you have a problem that you need to get it tested is that smell. Do you see that visible growth? Do you see you know black or brown staining? Um, sometimes it could be green, or or that furry looking cotton look in the corner of a room that water's been sitting in there is a telltale sign that you might need to get somebody out to take a look at it. Okay. And I guess maybe a little bit of a follow-up question to that is, you know, obviously you want to get it tested. What, what, what's the difference from, from your perspective on maybe a test kit you could get at Home Depot versus a mold assessor? Are we what, talking similar things or are there some huge differences? Huge differences because although you can get a test kit and you may test one area, um, mm -hmm. getting somebody who's licensed and certified can tell you where that problem's coming. In. Why do you have that problem, right? How deep do we need to go? Is it something that, that's going to be persistent or something you can take care of right away and kind of be done with it? Um, so, you know, you can test one, sm one spot. And it can be from an article of clothing that's been outside and it has mold in it. Doesn't necessarily you have an issue inside the house. That's a great point. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Good input. All right, Mark, I'm going to go to you next, uh, especially when it comes to roofing. I mean, honestly, when we talk about natural disasters, Florida hurricanes, and honestly, some of the video I've seen uh, from Louisiana about things flying through the air, roofs is the first thing that comes to mind. So if you're, if you're going to have to worry about that roof and getting it re-roofed, you know, what, what, all the, what all materials are, are we going to have to worry about? And, and right now, is that going to be hard to get? Um, they have been hard to get. Certain colors are hard to get. Okay. Um, I tell people, you know, my customers, hey, you know, I hope you're flexible in your color. You know, if you want a brown and you want a medium brown, I might have a little bit of darker one than you want or a little lighter one than you might want. But if you want that exact one and you're patient, you know, it may be next year before I can roof your house. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, most of the time, people are pretty good and they'll say, look, uh, something that's gray. All right. As long as it's not black. And mm -hmm. that's that's not a problem. Browns are OK. Most, most of the colors, you know, I haven't had any problems with anything, really, you know, because I, I try to convince the people beforehand to be flexible. You know, it, it, it's like you can't go to Lowe's or Home Depot take show have that have that little thing you know that you're going to paint and get the exact paint well you can't do that with a roof right okay so that that's the thing about that but back to uh hurricanes and natural disasters i mean we're in this for what three more months right mm -hmm. november yeah yeah september. okay so the thing is uh first thing to go is going to be shingles they're going to be flying off the roof Chances are, if you had a roof put on, say, within the last 10 years, um, it's probably going to be okay. I mean, all the ones, the last one that really came through and did some damage here was Hurricane Irma. And I didn't have any of my customers call me and say, hey, the roof you just put on, we lost some shingles. I didn't have that. I had anybody and everybody was calling me then, but it wasn't any of my customers. So that shows two things. It shows that it was put on properly. It also shows that the materials are good. Okay. Because after I'm gone, uh, who's watching that house? What's well, the materials 
that's covering it. Okay, after you know the check's been cashed and they kind of forgot who who you know who did their roof, or maybe they'll remember, but you know they they um, they're they're still protected because of the work that was done. So um, you know the materials are good. I mean, once we had. I really go, got full steam into this after Hurricane Charlie, which was 2004. I mean, I've had my licenses for a while, but after, after Charlie, the, the demand for roofing just went up and then, in, and then after Irma, it went up and never stopped, so. Okay, uh, a great input. And um, I, it's, it's nice, I'm sure for you as well, when you know you've put on all these roofs and you're not getting those calls because that, oh, there's just great. that reassurance yeah. that, yeah, again, not only that you did a good job, but that the materials are really holding up to what you expect, which is yes. good. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Elliot, so when it comes to um, the properties in general, because I know you've seen a lot, done a lot, um, you know, being a, a GC, what are, what are some of the things that, um, that you've seen that maybe could have been avoided um, probably by landlords since we're talking about real estate investing here, but, but, you know, things that, that maybe they could have avoided and um, you know, maybe they could have saved some money. Maybe they, maybe they spent too much, but you know, where, where are some common mistakes that you've seen? Definitely that repair, repair always costs more than prevention. A hundred percent of the time, never, ever is something going to, once a roof leaks, once mold gets in there, uh, once you're calling your insurance company, it, th those are always worse scenarios. Um, I actually had a specific scenario where a landlord didn't want to trim a tree because he just, you know, it's a rental property. I don't care. I don't care. And it was a $500 tree trim. And it just, the, the limbs were literally touching the roof. And uh, about nine months later, got a phone call. Oh, there's a big leak at that house. And we thought it was a plumbing leak or whatever. It didn't really connect immediately. And we went out to the house and sure enough, the, the, the gentle breeze had no storm, but just the gentle breeze had, had raked. And I'm sure Mark seen it. I mean, it raked off the, the shingle, eventually got into the underlayment. So he went from a, a $500 repair to a $3,500 repair. And I, it's, you know, just because you're a landlord, it, it, don't get away from gutters, tree trimming, uh, invasive trees, um, exterior painting. Um, a lot of people don't like to exterior paint. They figure oh, it's just a rental. I'll leave it alone. Paint mm -hmm. isn't really there for color. It's really there to keep the home. Cinder blocks, cinder blocks don't hold water back and neither does stucco. Mm -hmm. um, so really that, that paint, whether it's gray or white or blue or brown, it's really there to protect the home from moisture intrusion. And while you're at it, you're caulking the windows, you're caulking and, you know, kind of checking on the home, even something like a porch light, if it's got a real bad invasive space, mm -hmm. can let water in, um, in buckets. Uh, those are all excellent points. And I, and I gotta be honest, I, you know, it's something that early on, never even would have thought about you know it's a concrete block what do you mean water can come through that but until you've lived here and seen exactly what can happen you're absolutely right that paint is critical to that so great great points thank you very much yeah and All a right. gutter a gutter cleaning goes a long way to get to get people oh, yeah. uh, clean your gutters i mean that the water just when the water's just rolling off the gutter not coming down the downspout mm -hmm. it, it's it's just not doing the home any good no, that's a great point. The gutter is not there to be a leaf holder. <laughs> Very true. All right, uh, Colleen. So obviously insurance is a big part of any hurricane season. Um, when, when, should, when should a claim be reported um, to your insurance company you know, after damages occurred? I mean, is there, obviously there's gotta be some timeline here. So what, what can you tell us about that? So the claim should be reported as soon as possible. So some insurance companies have toll-free numbers that are 24-7, especially during this time of year. So you can always, you know, report over the phone. Some have online ways to do it. Um, you can also email your agent and he or she should be able to help you. But as soon as possible, because you want to let the carrier know that something happened. 
And, and is there, I mean, I, and I probably should know this, and for some of my policies, I, I probably do, um, but honestly, I'd probably call you with some of these questions. Um, but is, is there, uh, you know, like a, a maximum timeline? I mean, you know, let's say the damage occurs, I've got a lot going on, I don't think about it, you know, I get to it 45 days later, is, is that going to be a problem? Well, there are some cases like that where you didn't know about it. Could be a rental property. Your tenant didn't tell you, hey, there's a leak over here in my roof. I didn't really think anything of it. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as possible, they may want to know within two weeks time, certain policies have certain guidelines, you know, with claims. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if it's a rental property and your tenant, you know, didn't tell you about it, or you were in the hospital, you were ill, you were away and not at your home, you know, those are reasons why you may not know. But, you know, normally after a large storm or an event, you know, if you own more than one home, you're probably going to go look there or, you know, call the property manager and say, hey, did anything happen? So as soon as possible, I mean, the longer you wait, the more questions the insurance company is probably going to ask you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very helpful. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, let's see. Certainly back around, Larry, got another question for you. And um, so being being public adjuster, uh, when we do have a natural disaster, like something like a, a hurricane, I know, what 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 typically does the public adjuster do? What's their role? Well, obviously, um, our, our goal is to help help the homeowner, help the claim uh, claimant, help the uh, insured. Um, but of course, help them when it's safe. Um, you know, typically, depending on the size of the storm, 24 to 48 hours, uh, 72 hours uh, before you know you sh we should really be out there. Um, you know, of course, a lot of that depends on you know electric and self service and everything else. Um, you know, a lot of us you know build our business based on referrals. So um, you know, most of my business comes from. Uh, previous previous clients, uh, a lot of roofers refer me. Um, so you know, you get back out there and you help those clients when when it's safe. Um, and I just wrote down a couple things. Um, you're you're obviously going to uh, you know inspect the damage, um, see see how bad the damage is, um, catalog it, pick pick plenty of pictures, um, and if the homeowner you know uh, decides that they want to retain your services, then you're, you're gonna help them uh, file that claim with the insurance company. Um, and then beyond that, you know, and almost immediately you've got to get your, your vendor networks, whether it be, um, you know, our vendor network or their vendor network, you got to get people into action because the problem is, you know, after one of those natural disasters like that, um, it's like Mark was talking about, you know, people get so busy material gets short, uh, you know, it takes weeks for them to, you know, get material into the state, uh, you know, that's been affected by the disaster, um, you know, I mean, right down the fuel and everything else. So you got to get those vendor networks, uh, you know, going, which, um, you know, any good public adjuster, you know, has people that they can recommend, um, you know, roofers that they can recommend, contractors, and then of course, the homeowner, you know, if they have people that they would prefer to use, you know, we're, we're you know, we're not in the reconstruction business. Uh, we're just in the business to help them get the claim started right. Um, you know, we, a claim is, you know, we explain it to our clients, it's like baking a cake, you know. Uh, if, if you don't put all the ingredients in the right order in the end, the cake doesn't taste very well. And it's the same way with a claim. If you, if you don't, you know, it, it's like Colleen was saying, you know, filing in a timely manner and, and she's 100% correct. Um, you know, the insurance company does question late filing. Um, so those are all things that we try to help the homeowner with. And, you know, the average homeowner, most of them have never filed an insurance claim. So they don't have a clue of the process. All right, I, I have kind of a follow up question to that. So I'll make sure and hit you with that question in just a minute. Um, let's move on for a second here. Jeremiah, we, you know, we were talking about how we can identify um, if there's mold. And I know one of the questions that I, I've seen come up many different times is, 
okay, so I have mold, uh, you know, all, all I need to do is go spray, spray some bleach on it. Is, that, is that true? I mean, can bleach kill mold? No, no, it does. It, it cannot. And most of the time, the, the best way to explain it is mold, mold is, think about it almost like a person, right? It needs certain things to live, right? We need air, we need food. Mm -hmm. So um, for mold, it needs water, right? Moisture to, to, to live, right? To breathe. It's a, it's a real living organism. So if you take a root and you just spray bleach on one root, one vein, one piece of that tree trunk, you're not gonna kill it, mm -hmm. all right? You can kill the signs of it. You can bleach the color so you don't see the, the darkness of it, but you're not gonna really kill it. Um, so no, bleach doesn't kill mold. There's a couple other factors that need to play a part in it to really eradicate it. Okay. And that's why they need you. <laughs> exactly. All right. That, that's good to know. I, you know, sometimes you hear those old wives tales or what you think might be good information and find out, eh, maybe not. So I'm glad you cleared that up for us. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Mark, um, roofing question. Yeah, when, when you are looking at a um, like a flat roof, it, 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 do do people re-roof a flat roof? Or I mean, do you need to change the pitch? What? How, how does that work? I mean, I, I've seen several flat roofs, and it would seem like a lot of water would sit on top of that. What what's the, what's your take on that? That's what happens is a lot of water settles on it. Now the oldest roof is a flat roof. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we can go back to the Roman Empire, okay? Sure. And actually a little before then. Um, um, what was it, the Greek empire, you can see a lot of flat roofs. Okay, so this isn't new. Okay, this is the oldest roof that there is. But the thing is, a lot of those older roofs are made with concrete. Okay, and they're really thick. Um, even though the water might have set there. Um, the problem is here in Florida is when the water sits there for more for 48 hours or more, there's a problem because it starts working its way down into the roof. Okay, in through the material. Now, if uh, somebody calls me and they got a 100% flat roof, um, I'm gonna have to pitch it. I'm gonna have to put a pitch on it. There's a couple of ways it's done. I can build one out of uh, like two by sixes, stack it up in the middle of that roof and then slope down the plywood and then put the roof covering over the top of that. Or they also have this um, like a insulation, foam insulation type of, where it starts out, it's one, it's a little bit tipped this way, and the next one's tipped a little bit more, and so on and so forth, just a fraction of an inch. So that when you have a commercial roof that's say 50 feet long or 100 feet long, you've got enough to be able to do that. So uh, now um, in Orange County, City of Orlando, and I think Seminole County too, they won't let you just take off a flat roof and put another flat roof there. Okay, if you pitch a flat roof, I mean, if you do a flat roof, you have to pitch it. And um, yeah, you might be able to get away with it. A lot of times those inspectors, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're laughing before I've even finished my sentence. But let me, let me t finish the sentence for the people that don't know what I'm gonna say. Is right. There's a lot of times those, those uh, inspectors just, they don't even go buy the house. I had two, two roofs within the last week and the homeowner was there for finals. <clears throat> they said, I don't think he came. I said, well, let me look. So I go online because sometimes they get so busy they can't get it the day that you schedule it. Right. But not always. Usually they will get it that day. And I look, it's like it passed. And he says, I never saw anybody here all day. And I was, you know, I've been working at my desk which is by the front window. I said, well, I don't think you, you know, are not, are not seeing in things that are happening. I think they just, you know, they may have driven by and they may not have even driven by. They might just write it off because they got too many to do and they're just signing them off. So, uh, but I'm saying that because some people have put a flat roof on a flat roof and gotten away with it because the inspector never came by. But if the inspector is observant, they're going to take a look. I might put a level on that thing. And mm -hmm. they're going to say, uh-uh, we're not going to pass this thing because you're going to end up with the same problems that you've had before. 
So um, they do need to be pitched. They're a lot. They're going to last a lot longer if you do pitch them, but they're a lot more expensive. Uh, but what do you want to do? You know, you're going to hang on to this house for a while. Maybe you're not going to live in it. Maybe you're going to rent it. Maybe you're going to sell it. Okay, maybe you're looking to sell it right away, but don't you want to sell a good house to somebody? You don't want them getting upset with you and saying, hey, the year after you sold me that house, the roof started leaking in the flat area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we at CFRI want to, you know, separate ourselves from other investors that are not doing things properly, you know. Anyway, uh, that's the thing. You just, you got to pitch it because it's going to prevent a whole lot of problems if you do. All right. Uh, awesome. I, 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 again, I kind of always suspected that, but you know, you, you, you've been around here long enough and seen enough roofs. You, you obviously have seen flat roofs, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Mark. Sure. Elliot. So, um, you know, from the overall perspective of construction and preparedness and whatnot, what, um, what would you say, you know, for the audience in general, especially us as investors, what what are what would you recommend that are some of the things that we need to do to prepare our properties for a something like a storm? I think a, a visual walkthrough is definitely important, um, and I don't mean inside; I really just mean outside in general. Um, and and the same things we talked about earlier with the gutters, the trees, uh, mm -hmm. anything loose in the yard. If you got a tenant that you know, fence panels are down, anything like that. A, a fence panel, for instance, can go flying in a storm uh, as we're seeing the footage coming out of Louisiana. I mean, something that weighs a hundred pounds is, is just gets flicked across the room. Um, so if I was a landlord and had say five properties in Orlando, somewhere in about February, March, I would, I'd take a trip around town uh, when the, when the pricing made sense and said, you know, Hey, let's get this picked up. Let's get that picked up. Um, I would keep a spreadsheet of the years of my roof. So I have a lot of customers that are like, oh, I just put that roof on. And you're like, yeah, it's 13 years old. Well, what do you mean it's 13 years old? And I'm like, permit says, <laughs> oh yeah, I guess it was back, you know. So um, I think keeping an active tally of how old your roof is, um, windows, if they're in bad condition and you can upgrade them um, and, and own, if I was a landlord, I would own a couple of tarps and a couple of, you know, little box of button nails because those are the hardest things to come by after a storm. Um, I'm talking a little bit about a kind of more of a hands-on landlord, but I can tell you from property management, if if you're a property manager, you you don't have 300 tarps in your garage, and if you manage 300 properties, you got a problem. So um, if you've got the opportunity or you've got a good relationship with somebody that's that does maintenance on your property you know, get that, get a, get a tarp, get a ladder, have something ready, uh, to mitigate further damages. Um, and then, and then preemptively go around and check, you know, pick a month of the year to check on everything. Mm -hmm. And then every four to six years, you ought to be putting a roof on one of your houses at some point, I'm sure, you know, in five houses, every few years, you should be rotating it. So you don't end up with one year where you're putting on five. Very good point. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I, I can even see taking that a little bit further and saying, you know, like you said, if you're the proactive landlord, maybe even um, having like a, uh, a tip sheet for, for your renters that says things like, you know, make sure you do have water on hand, make sure you plan for a lot of the things that Larry and a couple other people are pointing out, prepare for this before the storm, and even including little tips, um, like you were just saying about, you know, check around the yard. Is there anything that's loose? Is there anything we need to fix? And, and do you have anything yourselves, like patio furniture and, and things of that nature that you need to bring inside or, or whatever you might need to do? Because, uh, yeah, again, things get airborne quickly, and that can cause quite a mess, for sure. I've, I've definitely, even in small non-hurricanes, I've seen the old patio table and chairs, you know, go wiping across the patio and that's in 40 to 60 mile an hour winds. So oh, when, yeah. you, when you double that, it's, it's, it's all bad. Very, very good point. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see, Colleen. So, um, you know, we were talking about the, the being prepared from an insurance standpoint and getting those, those claims reported. Um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, how you can best be prepared to show that there is damage. So, 
you know, is, is it a good idea to like have pictures and receipts and things like that, especially when damage occurs so that you can show that to the insurance company, the adjuster, you know, is, it, is that one of those things where you would recommend having maybe before and after, or at least some good documentation to go with it? Absolutely. Um, yes, I would recommend as far as what Elliot just mentioned, doing some walkthroughs a couple times per year, because I can't tell you how many times the clients were like, I don't know, I didn't notice anything. And they haven't been out to their rental properties, you know, in, in the whole year, or they just get the money, you know, every month, but somebody needs to go look at that and take pictures before, because if you had a large tree limb that hadn't been cut down, and it damaged the roof during a regular storm or a, a major storm, not so much because it could have happened, you know, regardless, but, you know, minor damages. So you always want to document so you know what it looked like before a loss and after a loss, you know, regardless of big and small. If you have to make any repairs on your own prior to the insurance company coming out, you would want to take pictures before and after, save any receipts, any estimates for anything that has to be done because you want the property to be safe for your tenants or yourself, but you want to be able to show, you know, what you repaired. Because I've had a couple of clients who repaired their roofs and they didn't take any before pictures. Well, they couldn't show <laughs> that it happened during that storm, you right. know, so um, that's kind of one of those positions that you got it fixed. And then months later, you're trying to put the claim in. Um, that's probably when you would have to contact Larry, because <laughs> that would be like, he would probably say, I can't even do that because you've already repaired it. How do we know? So yes, document your files, keep checklists, keep pictures, keep a file for each home and just put, you know, receipts in there to to show you've been maintaining it before the loss, during the loss, and after it. Uh, th this is kind of a little follow-up to that, maybe a little bit of a curveball. I, I hope it's not anything terrible for you, but I'm really kind of curious. Does it, would it matter if you had a picture versus a video? Is, is, is one or the other better? No, I would say it depends on what it was. So if it was like an active leak, mm -hmm. probably a picture wouldn't show it. So you would want to actually show, you know, hey, look, it's leaking. Um, or if you had uh, rain coming in the walls or something, you would have to be able to show. But a picture would be just as good if it was like a hole in the wall, you know, anything that you could see. But to show an act active leak or active mm -hmm. wall intrusion, yeah, you would want to actually record that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, let's circle back around to Larry then, because I, I know um, one of the questions that came up in our group of questions, uh, we, we have we have some interesting ones in here, but uh, I, I think one that probably a lot of people want to know, Larry, is, all right, so... I, I know I can use the public adjuster. I, 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 I could maybe call Colleen. I could call State Farm's 800 number. You know, what, what's really the process here? You know, do I, do I call Larry first? Do I, what, what, what happens? What's the order here? Well, you know, we would prefer to be, you know, the first one called. Um, okay. There's some new legislation in Florida. And, uh, you know, I, I know there's, uh, you know, Jeremiah and Mark and Elliot all on here and, and, uh, love everything that all those guys have said, a lot of good information. And there's a need for, you know, all of those in their place, you know, in the correct order. Um, I'm not gonna say that, you know, the public adjuster, you know, should be used instead of the roofer, but the problem is like, there was some new legislation that just pa passed uh, July the 1st of this year. Um, it's, a, it's on a stay right now, there's a, there's a challenge. It's a, it's a freedom of speech challenge, but, but basically what they're saying is, uh, you know, in the state of Florida, there's only three people that can adjust a claim. So what we try to do is we try to get the homeowner indemnified to the point where they're back to their pre-loss condition, okay? And, um, you know, again, the contractor has his place, mold and remediation have their place, uh, you know, all of those people have their place in, in the process, but only three people in the state of Florida, three, three businesses in the state of Florida can adjust the claim. That's the homeowner. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most homeowners are arguing or even investment, you know, people are, are arguing from a, 
and I, and I don't mean this to sound bad, but we're all ignorant in different areas of our lives. And, sure. and you know, they may be arguing from a, a, an ignorant point where they don't know what a roof should cost or, or what it should cost to re-drywall, you know, a damaged area. Um, so the homeowner is one. Number two is a public adjuster. Mm -hmm. And number three is an attorney. Okay. So, you know, the problem is that we all have our place, but what what can't happen any any longer, it's been going on for quite some time, but it can't happen any longer is that a roofing company can't get on with an insurance company and argue price. Okay. They can argue scope, but they can't argue uh, the claim, you know, what they're paying on the claim. So, you know, a lot of times when you argue scope, it will get you additional funds, but they can't argue for the funds. Okay. And, and that's where the public adjuster, you know, we're able to um, argue the money, not just the scope. Um, so, you know, um, like I said, we all have our place. Uh, there's definitely a need for everybody in this scenario. Um, you know, we get the, we get the homeowner indemnified and then we get them the money to choose, you know, whatever mold remediation or roofer that they want to choose. And, and we're not in that business. So, uh, at that point we're hands off and we let them, you know, choose whoever they, they prefer. Excellent. I, that's great input. I appreciate that. All right. Um, speaking of the, you, you mentioned the mold remediation again, we're going to go back to Jeremiah and, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, and, and I believe this was uh, one of the great questions that we had asked as well was, you know, if I'm, let's say I'm going to buy a property and, and, and there is mold in it, is, is that something that as I go into that and I get, the, I acquire the property and I, I ensure it that the insurance company is going to cover remediating that mold? I'm going to say no. And the reason why is most of the time, when you buy a home as is in that condition, the insurance company doesn't know about it. Um, in most cases, I've dealt with a lot of them. And, you know, they say, well, this mold just showed up. Most of the time we can tell whether that mold is, has been preconditioned, is that it's been there for months, or mm -hmm. is it brand new? Um, and that's mostly a water loss, right? Um, mold can happen in 24 to 48 hours. If the conditions are set right, it's water, it's humid, it's, mm -hmm. it's hot, it has all its, its nutri nutri ah, nutrients to grow, it's right. gonna go ahead and grow. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, most people buy homes and, um, and the condition is already there. There's already water loss, there's, always, there's already rot, um, which is a telltale sign from that moisture and water damage, which gives it away that it, it probably was there before you bought the house. So um, I tell a lot of investors, and I'm an investor myself, I don't go in, see that it's got mold and say, hey, I could probably wait till I get insurance, let Colleen write me a policy and then yep. go after it. Yeah. In most cases, 100% of the time, it's not gonna work. Okay, that's good heads up for everybody to know for sure. Yep. All right, um, Mark, going back to the topic of the roofs for a minute. And, uh, you know, we, we, we definitely want some pitch in there. Uh, one of the things that I've heard several times, and I, I believe I've even uh, seen and maybe had it done a couple of times, but I've never, I don't know that I ever really totally understood what they were doing was a roof over. So when you hear the term roof over, what is that? And, and is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It's very bad. Okay. Very bad. Okay. Um, basically what it is, is somebody doesn't want to put out the money to have the roofers take off the old layer of shingles. Okay. So but they, what they do is put a new layer of shingles right over the top of the old ones. So you think, wow, that's pretty good. You got two layers of shingles, you know, it should last longer. No, it doesn't work that way. The old layer will suck the life out of the new layer. Mm. You, need a, you got, uh, honestly, you can get 20 years out of shingles if you don't have trees around the property. If you got trees, you got a lot of moisture there. It's probably not going to last. But I saw a house that I lived in back in 98. And within the last two or three years, they just um, uh, re-roofed it. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it set with the roof that I was, you know, that I had when I got the property. Mm -hmm. And the guy told me he just put the roof on. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. But uh, 
it, 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 the roof was fine all the time I lived there. And then I moved out, I rented it, and then I sold it. And every once in a while, I happen to be back in the neighborhood and I drive by, see what it looks like these days. And I notice they put a new roof on it. Now, uh, so you can get 20 years out of it. They call them 30 year architectural shingles, but they don't last 30 years, right. not here in Florida anyway. Right. Um, where would they last? Well, there's no moisture in Arizona, but it's too hot to last long. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know whether they last long out there or not. I kind of think they don't, but <laughs> I don't know, but uh, not here. So yep. uh, they put, they, they don't want to spend the money. They're, they're, they're becoming cheap Charlie and they ha have somebody just put a roof, a roof over the top. So there's not as much labor and there's not as much material. So boom, it goes up there. But, uh, and then you, you try to find that where that leak is. Mm -hmm. Good luck. A needle in a haystack. No, you're, you're, you're finding uh, some kind of uh, real small, it's not even a needle, you know, in a haystack. It's just so difficult to find. And then to be able to repair it, you got to take off all those layers of shingles. It, it's just a mess. So uh, I won't do them. I mean, it's legal to do them. Okay. Uh, it used to be legal to put a total of three layers on a roof at one time. Now they've since changed the law. But, and now they can only put two layers. And if you ask me, they shouldn't even allow people to do that. It's ridiculous that people do that because they just want to save some money and it, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it at all. And the other thing is when you do get that roof replaced, okay, let's say it's, um, let's say that roof is 20 squares. Okay, well, you are paying for 40 squares to be removed because there's two layers up there. They can't just scrape all that stuff off as easy as they would if there's one layer on it. They got to take that layer off and then they got to take the other layer off. So how many dumpsters do you need now? All that mm -hmm. stuff. Everything has gone up exponentially. So uh, I don't know if, if I came to a house, if I was buying a house and your inspector or you realize that there's two layers of shingles on that, on that house, I'd say, I want a discount. I want a price for a new roof. That's what I would say. And I don't care if the guy put the other layer of roof on last week. Right. You know, I, and, and he's got a permit to prove it. I don't care. Okay, I, I, don't, want, I, I don't want that mess that's going to end up being a Pandora's box down the road. You say, oh, well, there's no problem now. Yeah, well, you're just kicking the can down the road. There might not be a problem now. But eventually, when there is a problem, it's going to be a lot more expensive. That's one thing I don't like. Um, I, I just want to back up real quick here. And um, we're talking about who do you call first? Now, a lot of times people do call me first, but I, I point them right, I would point them right to Larry and say, okay, look, I can put a tarp on, I can do this or I can do that, but you know, you want me to put a new roof on and do it right, you better call, you know, call, you know, some Larry or somebody like him and get the ball rolling. Because otherwise, you know, I can give a price and they're gonna argue with me and tell me that's wrong. And right, I can't argue price with them. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we can order, argue scope. I actually, I was, I'll give you an, I, I want everybody to understand how important a, uh, I never even heard of a public adjuster and it was about, I don't know, 15 years ago, somebody called me, they had a fire in their house. Okay. The house wasn't totaled, but a lot of it was, and you have to take out all the wood that was coated with smoke, all that soot wood has to go. Okay, mm -hmm. and basically I told the guy, I called the, I was in touch with the, the lady's insurance company and he guy says, well, I can give you 90,000. I says, I can, I cannot build that house for not, demo this and build a house for 90,000. Right. It's impossible. Now this was a few years ago, okay. you know, and I said, I can't do it. I says, I, you know, 110 or something like that, I think it was the price. And we went back and forth and I said, he, he wasn't gonna budge. So somebody told me about a public adjuster, he ended up getting her 250. And now she didn't put that, okay. She didn't put the money directly in her pocket. Mm -hmm. She put it indirectly, like the money that I took to, to build a house, which was what I said it would be. And then the extra money went to the mortgage. So she didn't get to go to wherever, you know, get to go to 
climb Mount Everest or something with that extra money. Right. But however, there was she now owed a whole lot less on the house than she did before. And I was glad about that. And that's when I first heard about it, and I said, I'm never going to be working with just an insurance company again because th their job is to give you as close to zero as possible. And that's what I tell all my clients. They, oh, my, oh, their adjuster came out. He was a nice guy. Of course, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he wants to give you zip. He wants to give you a handful of air. Okay. Right. He has to give you a couple dollars extra. He'll do it, but he wants to get it close to zero as possible. And then he's going to give you something that's not even going to pay for the materials for me to do the roof, much mm -hmm. less anything else. Yeah. So that I just wanted to back up and talk about that. I think we're running out of time here, aren't we? We're getting a little close. Let me, uh, if it's all right, let me move on to Elliot and uh, Colleen and ask them one more question each if, and see if we can fit those in. Um, Ellie, I know we, we've talked a bit about this already, but was, I, I did want to circle back around to it. You know, when we're talking about um, being prepared, like from before a storm, is there anything from a building standpoint that, that we could do maybe that we haven't talked about yet or that you might want to mention to everybody that we can do to be prepared for a storm? I, yeah, I mean, I think everything we talked about is obviously pertinent. Uh, quality building materials, um, when you're like getting a roof and you're not changing the flashing and things like that. Again, I just see landlords that are just so intent on trying to make today's money that they'll, they'll buy like a lower grade shingle, or like I said, they'll, they won't trim the tree or that kind of stuff. So just having a little bit of a, it can happen attitude um, and using like a better paint, for instance, instead of just spraying, having a company just, just do a quick spray to, to make a house look good on the front to actually paint it and caulk it and prep it. And I can tell you, like I had a bid this month on a house that's never been painted. It's 21 years old. And I quoted it. It's a large home. And I quoted it at about $6,000. Mm -hmm. The guy's like, oh, I got a guy that'll do it for four. And I'm like, yeah. it's it's not going to be the same. <laughs> yep. And it's not that we're making $2,000 off it. It's that they're not going to prep it. They're not going to caulk crack it. They're not, it's a stucco home in East Orlando. Um, it, 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 it's, if you saw the pictures of it, it would look like a foreclosure. It's just never been painted. It had a darker color. It's got that whiting, uh, that it gets when the sun's just baked it clean. Right. Um, you know, you'd surprised you can't see in the living room, but with paint costs being what they are and, and, and with, you know, the amount of prep that home needs. Mm -hmm. Um, but sure enough, he opted for a, a, a less expensive contractor. Who's going to put less paint on the wall, take less time to prep it if they prep it. Mm -hmm. um if they pressure clean it if they pressure clean it well a home like that can actually prep for like three days prior to paint if you're if your painting contractor shows up at 9 a.m and he's painting at 12 on the outside of a home it's all bad <laughs> uh, that tells you something for sure that tells you how and they're done it they're done at six o'clock i see jeremiah mm -hmm. nodding because we've all seen it we drive by <laughs> it and um yep. It, it, it that that home would probably it's a big home it's a two-story home it's probably be a, a three-day prep it better be <laughs> just to get to painting yeah. and then probably another three days of painting so it's a six-day project six thousand dollars not that really fundamentally not that expensive for a large crew with you know insurance and licenses and all that um but again he opted to after after not painting it for 20 years he still opted to go with a cheaper version so and he's already had a leak in his living room, which I documented with a flare. Oh my gosh. So even after having a leak in the home, he's still going with a cheaper option. Stepping over. Yeah, some people stepping just over dollars leave. to get to dimes. Yep. You're absolutely right. All right. Uh, we'll have uh, let's see, we'll do one more question for Colleen. Let me remind everybody if you haven't already to uh, put your contact info in the chat. You may even want to do it again just so every it's current for everybody so that they can see it. And, um, and Colleen, the question I have for you, um, I, I've, I've been looking at um, some different properties that are near water and, you know, they talk about like the flood zones and whatnot, but when it comes to natural disasters and everything, what, what exactly is considered a flood? Okay, so a flood is actually rising water over two or more properties on the same street. So if you and your neighbor's house floods from external water, rising water coming into your property, mm -hmm. that is a flood. If mm -hmm. just your house floods, they may argue it. 
I did have a client who, who lived near the 408 in Orlando and there was water coming into her home from like a drainage or the sewers, whatever. She had a lot of water. I mean, inches of water. And her, not only did her house flood, but the lot next to her. So not another house. So the insurance company tried to argue with her and say she wasn't covered. But I said, well, it was two properties because the lot next to her, she doesn't own. And after a little bit of negotiation, arguing, they covered her. Um, so that was a little odd scenario, but it's two or more. So that is really good to know. I, I never knew that definition. So that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I see that we are at 802 and I know we've got to get started on our meeting after the meeting. Obviously, we're certainly going to invite all of you to partake in that as well. And uh, let me say thank you so much to everybody for being on our panel tonight. Larry, Mark, Jeremiah, Elliot, Colleen, thank you so much for being here. I, I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. We hardly ever do, but we got a lot of great information from some really awesome experts. And again, thank you for being here. Buffy, anything you want to uh, add before we close it out? No, I have put the link in a couple of times during the meeting. So if you'd like to um, join us, if you're a CFRI member for the meeting after the general meeting, click on the link and register now. You'll get a different Zoom link. We're going to close this one out. It'll take me a couple minutes to get situated and we'll open the other, the new Zoom link up. And uh, we're going to break into groups and it's a lot of fun. It's interactive. It's a meeting. So turn your cameras on, open your microphone up and, and let's talk real estate. Absolutely. Again, thank you everybody for being here and being a part of our September 1st meeting. Fingers crossed that we don't have too many natural disasters to worry about in the next three months. And um, hopefully if you do, you're going to be better prepared. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, guys.